Hi everybody, Dana Sparks, broker of Maximum One Greater Atlanta Realtors, and I've got what you've been waiting for. Today is the first in a series of changes to the 2022 Georgia Association of Realtors, or GAR, contract forms. So let's get started. Well, before we get started, just want to let you know that I am also the director of the Georgia Real Estate Academy, and we offer a lot of classes, CE classes for three hours of CE credit on the 2022 GAR contract changes. I will link the calendar below our classes. We welcome agents from any and all brokerages. We have some classes. They are hosted by Maximum One offices throughout Metro Atlanta. And uh, we have some actually in an actual physical location, as well as a lot of virtual classes. So please join us for the classes for a full three-hour CE credit on uh, all of the GAR contract changes and a good discussion on those. But today, I just want to start you off on a series going through the uh, changes to the GAR contract for 2022. So I'm going to start with what you guys all want to know about. What changes has GAR, Georgia Association of Realtors, made to the purchase and sale agreement? Well, the good news about all the changes is there's not a whole lot in general, uh, but there is enough for a three-hour CE class <laughs> uh, regarding the purchase and sale agreement. Same thing. There's not a whole lot of changes, but there are a couple of um, pretty substantial changes in terms of clarification to agents as well as to the public about what's going on. So I'm just going to dive in. The purpose of this video is just to uh, sort of give you an introduction into what the changes are. Um, I will do further videos later on with a more in-depth discussion about the ramifications per the contract and uh, the impact on the buyer and the seller regarding what they agreed to in a contract. But for today, uh, let's just start with the GAR Purchase and Sale Agreement, F201. And uh, the very first change is uh, just under where it talks about who the closing attorney who's going to close the uh, the closing law firm. So it's under paragraph A5, closing law firm. They changed it to just say law firm, and they've added the attorney's phone number. So that's a nice thing for some of these closing attorneys that have multiple offices. Uh, that way it will help clarify which of the specific offices where you are closing. Another clarification under paragraph A882 A8, under the due diligence, additional option money for a the seller granting the buyer the right to terminate, uh, which is what a due diligence period is. For additional option money, again, this has always been the, clay, the case, but it is now they've added a sentence for more clarification. And it just says that the uh, buyer has paid additional option money directly to the seller. Again, I'll do a video on option money as opposed to earnest money in a later video. But that is a change that they added the word directly to the seller. And they also added the option for an ACH payment as the form of the money. Under the holder of the earnest money... Uh, under paragraph B6, they've added a little bit of information uh, that does give the holder the right to uh, charge the buyer for any costs associated with holding the earnest money. Uh, in other words, <laughs> if the, uh, let's say the buyer sends the earnest money in the form of a personal check, and for whatever reason, it's not honored by the bank and the holder incurs bank fees for uh, uh, a, a check that's not honored. Usually the holder will incur, well, those bank fees, the holder now has the right to charge the seller, I'm sorry, the buyer, the cost of those fees and it's on top of the earnest money. So just a, a little bit of additional information there. Um, then another clarifying sentence under notice. So, and I'm going to do a whole 
separate video tip on notice because this gets a little bit confusing, but it's under paragraph C1B, delivery of notice. And this has always been the case, but Gar has added a sentence again for clarification. So it hasn't always been the case, but it was always the case, at least as of last year, and I believe the last couple of years. Uh, the notice section in forms of electronic notice, which will be noticed by fax and by email, uh, which the majority of contracts we see nowadays, uh, notices are sent, contracts are sent via email. So this has changed throughout the years, but at least for the past couple of years, uh, it has stated that notice is deemed received by the recipient when the center sent it. Now that has always been in there. What got changed or what got added for further clarification, again, this is under paragraph uh, C1B, under delivery of notice. And again, it says, in the case of delivery electronically, on the date and time, the written notice is electronically sent to an email address or facsimile number to a party herein or subsequently provided by the party following the notice provision herein, even if it is not opened by the recipient. That has been the case, but basically it is deemed received when the sender can prove they sent it via that email confirmation or a fax confirmation, regardless if the receiver opens the email. Um, and again, they just added that clarifying phrase, even if not opened by the recipient. Now, under the other provision sections, under paragraph B, I'm sorry, C for other provisions, a couple of changes here. Uh, one is under the paragraph, subparagraph I, no authority to bind. And um, they've just added again for clarification purposes that basically it says the broker nor the affiliated licensee uh, by virtue of being the broker or the affiliated licensee. In other words, if you are representing the public as a client, uh, you shall do not have the authority to bind any of the party to terms. In other words, you can't. Uh, your signature does not bind the public buyer or the public seller to the terms just on your signature. And that has always been the case. But what they added is uh, that the broker does have the right to accept notices on behalf of a party. Again, if it is a, a, a on behalf of a party, but not send notices from the broker on behalf of a party unless they are signed by a party. If you have been in any of my classes or watched any of my videos, uh, you will know that um, I, I cover this all the time. Basically, agent to agent email does not bind the party to terms. E and what this is saying is even if an agent sends a form to another agent via email, if that form is not actually signed by the buyer or the seller, it is not binding upon the, it has no bearing on the contract because it's not signed by one of the parties to the contract, the buyer or the seller. So that part uh, is just spelled out for a little bit additional clarification. And then I'm gonna do a whole nother separate video on this on binding agreement date. For whatever reason, it does not matter how long agents have been in the business. There is so much confusion on the binding agreement date, and it's a very important date because that is the zero day from which all of the contingency timeframes are timed. So it is extremely important. But so they have added uh, some clarification regarding binding agreement date that references what happens if there is a dispute between the parties on what is the actual binding agreement date. Again, this is really important since the contingencies are timed from that day. If there's a termination notice sent and one party thinks the, the end of the contingency is, is today and the other party thinks the end of the contingency timeframe was yesterday, 
then what's at odds potentially is the disposition of the earnest money upon termination. So it's really important and there, there are disputes regarding this date. So a couple of things that GAR has done this year. They've added verbiage under the section subparagraph J. It's paragraph C4J, Notice of Binding Agreement Date, and they have added some verbiage regarding what to do if there is a dispute over the binding agreement date. Additionally, they've added a whole new subparagraph K, Objection to Binding Agreement Date, and they've added a whole brand new form, new form F733, Binding Agreement Date Confirmation Amendment. But what the subparagraph J says, Objection to Binding Agreement Date. If the buyer or seller objects to the date entered as the binding agreement date, then within one day from the receiving notice of binding agreement date, which is another form, the party objecting shall send notice of the objection to the other party. The objection shall be resolved by the written amendment between the buyer and seller by executing a binding agreement date confirmation, this new form F-733. The absence of an agreement on the binding agreement date shall not render this agreement unenforceable. The failure of a party to timely object will result in the parties accepting the binding agreement date as enter. Um, and again, I'm going to do a whole contract, a whole video tip on binding agreement date, how it can be established. It can be established beyond a doubt regarding the notices section of the contract, but we'll get into that and the definition of the binding agreement date, but we'll get into that uh, in another video. Also under uh, this other section, there is a whole new section, a whole new subparagraph called rules for interpreting this agreement. Again, if uh, agents understand this or should understand this, uh, but sometimes the public doesn't necessarily understand. And a lot of times this might, for whatever reason, get a bit confusing. So this is a really, I love this change, the sub paragraph that they have added under rules for interpreting this agreement. And what this has to do with is the hierarchy of what takes precedence over what regarding the terms of the contract. So let me, let me just read to you what it says. In the event of internal conflicts, uh, conflicts or inconsistencies in this agreement, the following rules for how those conflicts or inconsistencies shall be resolved will apply. Number one, handwritten changes shall control over pre-printed or typed provisions. Number two, exhibits shall control over the main body of the agreement. Number three, Special stipulations shall control over both exhibits and the main body of the agreement. Number four, notwithstanding the above, any amendatory clause in an FHA or VA exhibit, you guys also know those as uh, appraisal, content, uh, appraisal clauses in the v FHA and VA loan exhibit, so uh, notwithstanding the above, any amendatory clause in an FHA or VA exhibit shall control over inconsistent or conflicting provisions contained in a special stipulation, another exhibit, or the main body of the agreement. In other words, the provisions of the FHA is where it re with respect to the appraisal value, the provision of the FHA loan exhibit and the VA loan exhibit, because they are F they are government insured loans, those shall prevail. I'm going to do a whole nother video on this and the appraisal gap stipulation that seems to be so popular in our marketplace right now. But anyway, that's just a nice uh, clarification for everybody regarding what terms take precedence over what regarding the pre-printed handwritten exhibits, special stipulations, amendments, addenda, so forth and so on. Uh, and because they have that in that paragraph, they've taken out that section. It used to be uh, where it said exhibits and special stipulations. It used to say what controlled over what. So they've taken that verbiage out of that location and created this whole new sub paragraph C4L. Uh, additionally, thank you, Gar. 
uh, under paragraph five, under the definitions, they have spelled out what the definition of various days are. So Gar has spelled out what the definition of a bank of a day is. If it just says day, it refers to a calendar day. If it says banking day, it shall mean a day on which a bank is open to the public for carrying out substantially all of its banking uh, functions. For purposes herein, a banking day shall mean Monday through Friday, excluding federal holidays. You're thinking to yourself, well, wait, Dana, banks are open on Saturday. As I've said before in previous videos, Saturday, some banks are open on Saturdays. That is for consumer convenience. That is not considered a banking day for financial. Uh, no money is actually changing hands on Saturdays. And uh, then it goes on to define a business day. And it says a business day shall mean a day on which substantially all businesses are open for business. For all purposes herein, a business day shall mean Monday through Friday, excluding federal holidays. So for the purposes of the GAR contract, a business day is, in essence, the same thing as a banking day. And then again, it defines just day as a calendar day that goes through 11.59 p.m. that day. That has always been the case, uh, but it got confusing with closing dates and binding agreement times and so forth and so on. So... Uh, that is just spelled out for clarification, defining days. So thank you, Gar. We appreciate that. Um, and then that's it. That new form, there's a couple other new forms I'll get into, but uh, that one new form that I mentioned regarding the, um, I'm sorry, I already talked about that form. Then under where it has additional special stipulations, it has actually given a number for that form, which is F246. So Thank you guys so much for watching Dana Sparks. Stay tuned for more video tips on additional changes to the GAR 2022 contract forms. Uh, some you're going to like. You guys are going to love the changes to the Community Association Disclosure. Um, and again, I'll link below for our CE classes. Thank you guys so much for watching Dana Sparks, broker of Maximum One Greater Atlanta Realtors, satisfying your needs with service, innovation, and education.